Uh, won't be a lot of slides with this because I'm doing more stuff toward podcast uh, type deals. So you can work and listen, you know, for this to be your hustler food, so to speak. So it won't be a bunch of slides because one of the reasons that I'm getting away from that is when I'm online and I'm looking at presentations, a lot of times, unless I just have a lot of free time to sit and devote to that, I will cut out because I just can't sit there that long. So if you've got any work to do or you need any listing or stuff, this is in podcast form. So with that, my name is Glendon Cameron, and I'm going to introduce you to mental money. It's not what you think it is. I did a video about this on YouTube, but I didn't really go into really detail. I just kind of went into some of the techniques. But the first thing you have to do is become mentally rich first. Now, what is that? And I'm not talking about money. I want you to substitute the word rich, uh, a substitute abundant for rich. This is not prosperity ministry. So before you go, well, no, he going to tell us to throw up the money to God. No, not that. When you become mentally rich and abundant, you kind of change how money comes into your life. Uh, I'll give you an example. It's something I noticed and it happened to me when you are mentally poor and fiscally poor, you live a life of worry. You worry about if you lose your phone, will you have the money to get another one? You worry about if something happens to your car, you've only got a collision, so you don't have a car. A lot of bad things happen to you when you are mentally poor. And what it took me a long time to understand was the inner world will be a reflection. Well, the outer world will be a reflection of the inner world. So you have to start really thinking in terms of abundance. And this is something, like I said, sometimes I do crackhead stuff. If you've ever did the research, you know that. Thousands of laptops are left in airports every year. Laptops, uh, cell phones, babies, uh, all kinds of stuff is left in, two, left in the airport. So some of this is due to people being really, really busy, really, really stressed and careless. But another group of people that are kind of lumped in there are those who have an abundant mindset. When you don't worry about losing stuff, and this, I swear, this is the craziest thing. I will frequently go somewhere and not lock my car. And I'm just like, what the hell is wrong with you? It is just weird. And this is happening. This is something I struggle with because sometimes I just get preoccupied with what I do. And I'm just going, I would never do that if I was poor. Because it was so much, you know, if I lost the radio, it was just so much to replace and you have all of that stress. So when you become mentally rich, it's more about if I lose something, I will have the resources to regain that and get more. And it's more of a thought process than a fact. You start thinking like that, you're out of the world in time. And time could be anywhere from a week to two or three years, depending upon how mentally poor you are. When I was really, really mentally poor, I, I'm one of those people that took a few years because I was just like, oh, God, it's the system. It's everyone's out to get me. You know, the man's got his foot on my neck. And reality of that was none of it was true. It was me messing with my own self because I didn't know the techniques and the steps to become mentally rich. And the first thing you have to do is stop leakage. It's hard to become mentally rich when you're not handling the fiscal money that you currently have. If you only make enough money to live in a one bedroom walk up, that's where you live. Uh, there are many people uh, who are just um, overliving where they should be because of other people's expectations. There's nothing wrong with being poor fiscally, if that's where you are, but there's plenty wrong because someone in the hustle mindset put 
a picture of this person who had all of this expensive clothing on, but they were broke. And a lot of people do that. And the thing is, when I was in the boarding house, I kind of understood why people did that. Because every day is such a struggle that they go out and try to buy some happiness, but it's misguided because true happiness is something that comes from you. And it's not dependent upon things or buying things or this. It's, it's just something that springs internal. So big step is stopping leakage, get yourself a budget, and to see yourself in the future having more. There are many people that have put a mental fence around their success. I am a man with no degree. I am a woman with no degree. I, I mean, I've heard people say these things and they don't understand that they're actually voicing that and they are writing in their book of life, that's the chapter. This is what I am and this is all I can do. And then they make themselves become happy with the unhappy. It's like, this is all I'm going to get. I'm going to be content. And understand, being content and having gratitude for what you have, those are two different things. If you have a Yugo right now, and the Yugo gets you from point A to point B, you should be grateful because you have a running vehicle. Content is saying, this is all I'm ever going to get out of life. I don't think that's cool because you're selling yourself short. And I'm not saying you're going to get a Bentley, but, you know, put a Honda maybe a Toyota on the map. You know what I'm saying? So you, you have to see that you can make more money. Now, this is really, really a big, big question that many people never, ever ask themselves. How much? How much do you want? How much money do you want? Many people have never, ever thought about it. You will hear, I want as much as I can get. Um, Whatever the good Lord give me. Well, you know, I just want to be comfortable. Well, you know, there, we need two incomes to make a good living. Hmm. I hope to make some money. You do not hear any metrics whatsoever. None. Many people never say how much money do i want never quantify it never think about it just hope they'll say hmm, 70 is a good salary of 55 to 7 that's good it's like people are afraid to say i want a fucking three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and the reason is when you get to a number over 50 over 80, over 90, over 100, you have to start thinking, what kind of service can you provide to command that type of money? And that's when things start to get scary. And that's when things start to get a little crazy because you have to completely jump out of your shell all naked and shaking into the world and jump in this big pool of the unknown. And that's very terrifying. The pool may be great for you, but you don't know about it. Many people rather dance with the devil they know than the angel they never kissed. So you've got all of this fear. But that is a big question that I want you to ask yourself. How much do you want? Do not put a limit on it. If you want a billion dollars, write down a billion dollars on the paper. And then reverse engineer what you're going to have to do to get to the billion dollars. Then once you go through that process of reverse engineering, you may like, I don't really want to be because I don't want to do that, which is cool because then you start thinking. You start thinking. It's like, because the thing is, most billionaires who earned it in this new disruptive economy just served a lot of people. They came with an idea that was scalable and they served a lot of people. Um, you got to ask yourself, how much do you want? And to help you ask yourself that question, because a lot of people are like, that's when shame and that's when the Protestant work ethic comes into play. Well, I don't know. I should be happy with what I'm getting. There's nothing wrong with a hard day's work for an honest day's pay. There are all type of mechanisms and in social indoctrination that keeps you from wanting to have a lot of money because money's evil. The people who are rich, they're all popping pills. They're, they are alcoholics and their lives are just totally screwed up. 
I know a bunch of poor people that those same attributes apply to. Yes, there are rich people who are messed up. Yes, there are poor people who are messed up. It's not the money. It's the mentality. So ask yourself, how much do you want? What kind of life? And the best way to get to your number is to ask yourself, what type of life do you want? Do you like to travel? Do you like to stay at home with the kids? Do you like to race cars? Do you like to fly? Whatever your passion is, claim it, own it, and figure out a way that you can produce income so you can do it as much as possible. The lifestyle, because, you know, like I said, for many of those in the Hustler, well, all of you are in the Hustler University, I kind of slowed down the design of your life because people were like freaking out and it was the holidays. We will get back to that. But in designing your life, you do the life first, you do the business second. So that's a good way to say, what kind of life do you want? Do you want to go to Italy every year? Do you want to like take care of your mom? I mean, what do you want? You know, ask yourself those questions, put them on a sheet of paper and start thinking. Now, that that's a question that a lot of people, like I said, that's why whenever I do a consult, it's like, okay, we're going to give you a number because I know a lot of people have never really thought about it. Uh, the big thing is, to make enough to pay the bills because we all have been sold a bill of goods that there is some kind of nobility in being poor and struggling. I had it for many years. I grew up in Alabama, very conservative upbringing, small town. You work hard, you get a haircut, you get a job and you go to work hard. You work hard. That's, 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 that's it. That's the ultimate. And due to exposure and traveling the world, I was like, whoa, there's other things out there. There's nothing wrong with saying you want to make ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month. I will say, be careful who you share that information with. When you are breaking out of that shell and your little naked self is going to that big pool, you're very vulnerable, and a lot of people will take pot shots at you. Uh, who do you think you are trying to get to that kind of money? Who do you think you are trying to run a business? What you? You can have 15 people supporting you and that 16th person that goes, mm, I don't know about that. That's the one that will keep your ass up at night because we've been conditioned to respond and to reciprocate negativity. So understand that when you're doing this and you're asking yourself that number, it brings me to the next point, which is the comfort zone. You may have to go out and get some TNT, some mental TNT, some mental dynamite, some mental blasting caps and blow your comfort zone wide open. It will be very, very uncomfortable. It'll be exceptionally uncomfortable at first. You will might break out in hives. It's just going to be so much change at once. The more you do this, the easier it becomes. And as you do it, your comfort zone gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What does a comfort zone have to do with money? The money that you have and the money that you make fits your comfort zone. I'm just this kind of person. I don't really need a nice car. I'll get a Honda or I'll get a Toyota. I don't really need that. Now, if that's truly your thing, like if there are many people who don't give a damn about cars, they really don't. It's the piece of metal with some rubber on the bottom and it gets them from point A to point B. There are a lot of people who really don't care about cars at all. There's another group I love cars, but because it hurts their heart that they can't have it. So they deny themselves the, pre the privilege and the pleasure of saying, I want that. So you're going to have to really push your comfort zone first to get more money in your life. Because if your comfort zone stays small, you're not going to take risk. You're not going to expand yourself. Even if you have a brilliant opportunity right there in your face, you're not going to take it because your comfort zone cannot contain the opportunity. So you got to work on expanding it. And these are some exercises that will seem totally strange and have nothing to do with money. If you're a person that doesn't like going places by yourself, Make a monthly habit to go to five or eight places by yourself and then introduce yourself to 10 people every time you go. I don't care if it's the waitress. I don't care if it's food or the dog. I don't care if it's the, the waiter. Introduce yourself. Chat with them three to five minutes. As you do this, other doors in your comfort zone will open up because 
The beautiful thing about the human condition and the way that we're made up is when we do one thing, we get a benefit in two and three other places. So that's one exercise. Another exercise, create your list of fears and start doing those bitches. Just start euthanizing them. It's like, oh, I'm afraid of swimming. Take swimming lessons. I don't care if you're 80. Go take swimming lessons. If you are afraid of asking women out, pick a day. I'm asking 10 women out. Guarantee you, unless you are a quasi moto from the, you know, that's the hunchback of Notre Dame, you won't get up to 10. You won't, you will not get up to 10 unless you were just completely unfortunate looking. If you're a woman and you want to do, you want to wear this dress and people are like, hey, you know, it doesn't fit your body and blah, blah, blah. Wear the shit. Do it. You know, it may not fit your body, but at least you took a chance. You saw yourself in the mirror and it's like, hey, it didn't work, but at least I tried it. Push those comfort zones. I mean, you have to blast them because all your comfort zones are linked together. They're interlocked from the way what you drive, the way that you dress, all that stuff's interlocked. And that's why that people have, you know, um, it was an episode of Seinfeld and he had an opportunity to do something, I guess, like, you know, he's like, I don't want to be the porn guy because I've got to get the porn guy. I got to start wearing the porn jewelry. I got to start wearing the porn clothing. I got to get the bushy mustache. And the There's a uniform that we often have when we do certain things. And there are people who totally defy these uniforms. But typically, your comfort zones are going to contain everything that you are. So to change what you are, you have to push past those comfort zones with gusto. Now, another problem with um, mental money, and this is one I experienced myself. My mother was not good with money. And typically, if your parents are not good with money, you will inherit their bad habits. You may try to not be that way and you may be successful to a degree or strong, extremely successful, but how your parents handle money is typically how you're going to handle money, unless you're just exceptional. So if your money tree is janky, you got to chop that bitch down. You got to start anew. You will have to uh, go to financial counseling. I mean, there, there's free resources that can teach you how to handle your money. You just got to like, bam, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something different. I am not going to be like the fam. And if you have to play games like hide money from yourself, hide it. Uh, put it in a, an account that you can deposit money in. But the only way that you can draw money is you have to physically go to the branch. That technique works a lot for a lot of people. But your family money tree is can be a beautiful thing or it can be a damning thing. Now, how do you change the family money tree? If your parents are really bad with money, do the complete opposite of what they do. <laughs> That's what helped me with my situation, because my mom didn't save money. You know, she's you know when she got like when she got a lot of money, she was just like you know rich for the day, things like that. And I had to work very very hard to counter my financial DNA because it was just like, woo, we got money. Let's go get some new shoes and some popcorn. No. You have to change it. You have to learn how to pay yourself first, even if it's a dollar a week. Um, a beginning is yet a beginning. So even when you start with a dollar this week, this time next year, you may be putting away a hundred a week. You have to get started and stay started. So the family money tree, and you got to look at it. You got to go out there and lay down on the ground and look up and check those leaves out and start asking yourself questions like, why did they do this? And the simple answer frequently is they didn't know any better. No one taught them. Then they didn't teach you. And then you're not teaching your kids. And you just have generation after generation of poor fiscal management. And it doesn't get any better because no one goes down and chops down that janky family tree. But there's a lot of resources. I used to say you know, subscribe to Kiplingers. You know, everything's online. You can get on your iPad or phone. So you don't even have to buy magazines anymore. But really start working on that. Now, this is kind of creepy for some people, but start seeing money in your pocket. Now, that's something I used to do at the storage auction. I never put this in a YouTube video. I may never will. I would go up to a unit, and this is where it gets, you know, esoteric. I would get that itch. I would be in the front of the unit, and I'm just like, whoo. I would just start tingling. I don't, it was just like, whew, that's a good unit. 
And I just started seeing money in my pocket. And with literally it's like 1500 2000 I would just see the money. I would see the $100 bills. I would see the $50. Now, how this works is if you're just sitting in your chair, and it, it still can work to a degree, but it works better when you couple seeing money in your pocket with an activity. It's like if you sat in your chair and like, oh, I see a hundred bucks in my pocket. It could come. I've done it. It may take a year or two, but it can come. But if you're doing something and you're like, I see $10,000 cash in my pocket. Now, I don't know if you can do this because banks are real strict because banks don't have money like they used to. Used to be able to go to the bank and, you know, if you had a safe deposit box or if you had like money, you was like, hey, I want to see $10,000 because a lot of people have never seen that much cash in their hand. And the storage auction business brought me into that point where, you know, I had five thousand, I had ten thousand dollars. I mean, you know, the money with the band around it I had two bands, you know, two stacks in my pocket, like 20 G's. In the in the beginning, it was weird. I will not lie to you. It was kind of like, whoo, and see all those bad money things started to come in. Like I got twenty thousand dollars on me like a drug dealer. I asked, you know, that's what I said in my mind. That was the conversation I was having in my mind. There was no one else in the conversation. It was just me, myself, and I. And I was like, yeah, I got $20,000 in my pocket like a drug dealer. Because of the social conditioning that the only people who have large sums of cash are people who are doing nefarious things. And I had to slap myself. I'm like, I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not doing anything wrong. So start to see money, you know, and... If you don't have it, you know, banks, they don't even have like money situated. It's like this counter thing. Like when you get a bunch of money, actually, you know, this happened years ago. I went to a bank and I tried to get money. They didn't have enough cash in the branch to give me what I wanted. So I don't know how you can, you know, just start small, you know, see four or five hundred bucks in your pocket. Just see the money and couple it with an activity. Like say you're doing Craigslist or say you're doing Amazon FBA, say you're doing eBay, say you're doing any type of selling. Every time I do like a campaign or something, I write down what I want to make and either I come under it or I go over it. Sometimes I really miss and come way under it. Other times I'm surprised when I go way over it. So, but it, it gives me a reference point. Just start like when you're hustling. Okay, it's Saturday. Uh, I'm going to go out and get some stuff. Write down the income goal. Say, I want to get $2,000 worth of product. Like I said, with $2,000. Write that down. It gives your hustle way more energy versus I'm just going out trying to get what I can get. Remember when I talked about a get money hustler versus a strategic hustler? And a get money hustler is an opportunistic hustler. It's just like there's opportunity. And it's not bad because the best hustling is doing both. You have your strategic long term plan for hustling, and then you have Hey, some popped in your lap, but you had the resources and the mental awareness to take advantage of it. But many people are just get money hustlers or opportunistic hustlers. And there's really no long term benefits in that because you're consistently renewing your effort. You're not really building anything. You're not laying any bricks or foundations. And you can do both. You can be a strategic hustler and you can be an opportunistic hustler because it's fun. It's a lot of fun. But when you're doing your hustle, see money in your pocket. Actually see the money. Go online, look at the $100 bills, look at the $500 bills. Uh, it makes a difference. For me, it made a tremendous difference. I know it sounds very esoteric. I know it sounds a little crazy. But I would just see the money coupled with an opportunity to make money. When I wrote my first book, my income goal was $50,000. Uh, I made sixty two the first year. Went over it. And like I said, your goals, you can, you know, you're, you're going to need to come under. Some of you are going to like, bam, just nail it. And if you're a person who's consistently nailing your goals, every time you nail it, increase it 20%. You want to increase it till you stop nailing it and start stretching your mental money. So see money in your pocket. It is super, super huge. Now, part of seeing money in your pocket is building your expectations. Many people have low expectations that are wrapped in fear. They won't say what they really want because they, they're they afraid they won't get it. And if they don't get it, they'll be despondent and they'll be depressed and they'll be unhappy and they'll just be, 
Oh, why did I ask for that? And I didn't get it. Grow the fuck up. Disappointment is a part of life. Do not be afraid to want or go for something and just, you know, get to the point where it's like, if I don't get it, I'm just going to be crushed. We live in a society of uh, grown ass children who are so easily crushed and mashed by such trivial stuff. If you want something, you don't get it. Okay. That's not a point. That's not a point in time to throw a pity party. That's a point in time to say, you know what? I miscalculated. I didn't do this right. I didn't look at this right. Okay. Why did I fail? Oh, that didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't. it's a learning opportunity. None of this stuff about have big ass expectations. Um, you know, a lot of you know I got a new vehicle. It took me two years to buy that vehicle. I could have got it two years ago, but I was just like, my mind did not want to let the money go. <laughs> there was nothing wrong with Thor. It was just, it was just my mind. It, I had to work on me to get the new vehicle which is a 180 degree turn from what I used to be, which was a, a spin thrift. So understand your expectations are huge in mental money. They are huge. If you have small expectations and I want you to think about how goals work because an expectation is a, just another word for goal. So if you got small expectations and you come up short of a mediocre goal, how in the hell are you going to feel good about yourself? You see what I mean? It's one thing to fail big. It's another thing to fail small. So build your expectations, you know, and it's the, once again, this isn't, and it's really mostly a game of chess with yourself. You're trying to check, make your fears and you're trying to check, make your doubts and you're trying to check, make, your poor expectations. That's the battle. It's the internal battle. It's the biggest one you'll ever fight. So definitely work on dealing with those expectations. Now, when you really get good with this, you're gonna, this is another question that many people just don't ask. Are you worth it? Or, I mean, are you worth the money you want? When I was a scrub trying to holler at people from the passenger side, I wasn't worth the money. I had, didn't develop myself, didn't have a lot of skills. I had uh, two real core skills in the field that I was, just didn't want to be in anymore. I wasn't worth the money I wanted. You have to, you have to be real with yourself. We're like, okay, I want to make, because at the time, you know, the big thing for me was like making 65000 I was like, I want to make six. I just didn't have the skill sets. So if you're not worth it, and there's, there's another part of this that is very insidious. There are many people that feel they are not worth a good life. They feel bad things they did or poor or failures in life. It's just like, I don't deserve a house or I don't deserve love. Or These things go back to worth. If you don't think you are worth whatever, you're not going to get it. If you think from the center of your heart, from the core of your soul, that you're not worth this stuff, you're not going to get it. So are you worth it? And if the answer is no, then the next question is, how can I become worthy? What do I have to do? And do it. Sounds simple. And it is simple. It's just hard to do. <laughs> the execution is rough. But that's the plan. Because you got to ask yourself that and be real. Now, another part of middle money, which I've talked touched on, is changing your relationship with money. In one of my videos, I have a challenge. Don't spend money for a week. Because for many people, believe it or not, spending money is a habit. It has become a habit. That daily start, I mean, it's just become a habit. That's it. It's just, I have to spend money because it's my habit. I have a habit of spending money. So when you really... Sit back and ask yourself, why do you handle your money the way that you do? Just kind of lean back in the easy chair one day and just like, why do I feel the need to spend every dime I get as soon as I get it? Why can't my checking account hold like two, three, four hundred bucks for two or three weeks? There are a lot of people, seriously, their checking account has never seen like a thousand dollars for more than a month. Because as soon as it hits, you know. Uh, and back in the day, my checking account was a launch pad. 
Money comes in, then it was right back out. <laughs> it was right back out. And it was just like, it was really frustrating because you never felt like you were making any ground. You just felt like you were in the same place every day. So this is a technique that I help myself. And this is why I want you to start small. If you make big leaps, it's going to be very hard to keep it up if, until you develop more discipline. Take a buck. Take a buck. Save it for a week. Next week, save another buck. Next week, save another buck. Then the next month, double it. And just keep doing that for the end of the year because you have to recondition yourself that hold, of teaching yourself how to hold on to money. And if you try to do this big thing like, I'm going to save 50% of my income, it's not going to work because something's going to happen. You have to use the money unless you get another job. But really examine your relationship with money and why you're spending money so crazily. And ask yourself, why don't you spend money to help you make money? Many people spend money to satisfy emotional cravings. It's not the thing. It's the emotional attachment or the emotional craving with it. Tap into one of those things and you'll stop spending money like overnight. Another thing I deal with with um, a lot of my consults is many people don't believe they can do it. There's a lot of self-doubt. There's a lot of fear. Now, if you don't believe you can do something to earn the money, then you don't believe that you ever get the money. Those two walk on the same path. So everyone has self-doubts. You know, in my video, Hustlers Kryptonite, everyone has self-doubts. Uh, I put out videos. I'm just like, this is going to be booty. Then people like it. Then I put out videos like, yeah, I like this. And no one watches it. <laughs> you have to keep showing up. Self-doubt, fear, whatnot. You have to keep showing up. You have to keep showing up. The minute that you stop showing up, you're screwed. I want you to learn the difference between keeping money and making money. Now, there are people who are couponers, extremely thrifty. Uh, these folks can slice a penny five times down the middle and spend those. I have seen a group of people like that, and they're not hoarders. They're just extremely thrifty. They have money because of deprivation. And I haven't seen any of these people that were like happy. They were like, you know, thrilled to get that deal. But I never seen any of them really happy. Now, if you know someone who's like extremely thrifty, holds on every penny, and is extremely happy, let me know. I haven't seen them. I haven't met them. I, don't, I haven't met everyone in the world. So like I said, I could be missing people. But I, I used to deal with these folks when they came to the thrift store. They just weren't happy because I believe, and this is what I try to do, manage what I have and make as much, uh, make more. You know, when I say make as much, I have income goals. I'm looking at my board and I'm looking at my numbers. So manage what you have and try to make a lot more money. Because you get this dual effect. You see money stack up and you see money increase in terms of revenues. That's very gratifying for your self-esteem. But keeping money and making money. When you keep money, it looks good and you should keep some money. But the making money is the, the real action part. There's this guy, I think his name is Charles Stanley. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's here in Georgia. He started the company when he was 22, sold it when he was 28, made like three, four million bucks. He kept, the, he got, you know, paid his taxes and then he got a portfolio manager for three million bucks. But this is the real odd thing because he was doing the speech and he said he took 20% of that money. Or he, I think he, that's, I listened to him a lot of times. Because he said his terms was, I bit a little bit off. But he said that chunk that he bit off was work, was the reason for 90% of his wealth. The chunk that he bit off and put into the world and made active is what made the fortune grow. Because he could have kept the $3 million and invested in wisely and it would have been fine. But that chunk that he threw out into the world is what's going out there and it's going, yo, dollar bill, yo, dollar bill, yo. And they're like, what up, man? And they hop on that dollar and they go back to him. 
Now, sometimes it's like, yo, dollar bill, yo, dollar bill. Nah, man, we're going to suck you in and you lose money. But he said that chunk that he bit off for investments and being an angel investor was what made the other 90% of his wealth. So that brings me to middle money, money circulates. Money, money has to circulate. I noticed that when I spend money in the correct places, because, you know, since I'm no longer a storage auction now, I find myself spending money like the average consumer. Scary, I know. Um, but when I spend money in the proper places, that dollar bill goes out there as a single and comes back with nine friends. Money has to circulate. You have to put money out there. Now, let's talk about what I'm saying about money. There's cash. There's time. There's love. There's patience. All these things are forms of currency because all of them can get you physical cash. Love can get you physical cash. Uh, time can get you physical cash. Patience, uh, goodwill, compassion. All that stuff is currency. And you, when you give it out, it goes out as a single and it comes back with friends. And a lot of people do not put out that's right they're that chick that doesn't put out that's who they are it's like no these panties never come off so when you're not putting out chances are you're not going to get a lot back because you didn't put out i know one time when i used to go to church for those of you who know i am uh i do believe in god i'm just uh have issues with religion i was broke when I say broke, I only had like 300 bucks. To me, 300 bucks on you, that's all you got in the world, that's broke. And I took one of those crisp $100 bills and I put it in a typing plate. And I was like, I'll help some other people. Now, to uh, long story short, and is not shit happened if we put that $100 in a typing plate. I didn't get no payback from that at whatsoever, none. And it's weird. It's just like, Nope, nothing happened. Uh, I, you know, God was like, uh, I'm not impressed. Just letting you know I'm not impressed with that. So uh, essentially, knowing what I know now, I did it for the wrong reasons. I put the money in there to get something back, and the universe said, ha, ha, ha. No, we're not doing that. Because uh, I will tell you, I do this on occasion. I need to do it some more. I like to go to places, and then it's like lunch is on me to a perfect stranger. So, hey, I got your check today. The big old look on their face, the shit's awesome. And I have gotten more money from doing that type of thing because it's fun. And, you know, I'm not wanting anything from that person because the whole payback is their smile and the enthusiasm. That's my that's my currency. So I get immediate dividends. But when I do stuff like that, it's uh, just I get deals, I get consults. It's crazy. Because I'm putting out my mental money in the correct way. So, you know, just putting out the put out could get you um, digital, you know, mental mental money cooties or something like that. So that's pretty much the big thing with what I have done with mental money. When I think about money, uh, I'm doing activities. Every time that you start something new, like you're going to do, if you never did FBA, so to go, like, okay, my first 90 days, I'm going to make $3,000 net. You make it, you crank it up to 4000 You keep pushing that goal. You keep pushing it up and you keep pushing your activity. Because many people get to a point where they'll top out and they'll get comfortable and that's all they're going to do. A uh, common top out point on uh, YouTube is ten to 15000 for people who are hard charging. I'm talking about working a lot of hours a week, really putting in the tremendous. And their problem, you know, I've told some, is you got an infrastructure problem. It's not an effort problem. It's just your infrastructure cannot handle any more activity. And if it can't handle any more activity, you're not going to make any more money. And I, I did a consult with a guy and, you know, I knew what his problem was even before we got there. And I was like, you got to do this. You got to do this. You need to get rid of that. And um, he did follow the recommendations and he burst past his uh, sticking point. Because typically we're this stuff is not rocket science. If you're not making the money you want from eBay, or Amazon FBA is an infrastructure problem and it's an information problem, which can be solved. But typically, you have to really, really just crank up 
those mental goals. Because like I said, you'll just you'll hit a sticking point and you won't move. You will not move. And I see a lot of people who are just stuck. So if you want to make that money, whatever that may be, whatever your currency is, you know, for some of you, some of your currencies belly rubs. Some of your currencies back rubs, a foot rub, or a chocolate smoothie or something. It's a lot of ways out there for middle money. So with that, I'm going to pop out. And we are at the 40-minute mark. And I'm going to see if anyone has a question about the esoteric stuff. So while you are... <laughs> uh, okay, this has nothing to do with money, but I'll answer it. Uh, this is from Timothy. What is the 0 to 60 time for the BMW? It's uh, 6 seconds. Yeah, I, I, I messed up a guy on the Porsche the other day. What are helpful tools to expedite eBay, Amazon posting time? First of all, with eBay, I always recommend Ink, Ink Frog. But before we get to uh, to expedite, my question to you is: Are you buying stuff to make money, or are you buying stuff that you saw other people buy? I mean. You know, how many things are you listing? Because, you know, to better answer that question, I'll need to know what are you selling, what are you listing, what are you getting your stuff? Because there's a ton of tools out there. And like I said, there's Ink Frog. As for Amazon, there's some other stuff, but that's for people with high volume. If you're not like listing a ton of things, I wouldn't even recommend anything for Amazon. How can I be more incognito while taking pictures, scanning barcodes at thrift stores? You can't. Um, I've seen people just pull out their scanner and just go for it. Own it, man. Because uh, if they're going to throw you out, they're going to throw you out. If they're not, they're not. And more and more people are scanning. Uh, this is from Isaiah. Extreme couponing has a very high time cost. Tips on balancing activities with high time cost with general hustling. Uh, great question. I always go back to the big payout. If like, okay, give you an example. And I had to talk to someone I knew out of this. This person would spend $10 in gas to save two bucks. There are many people who get caught up in the savings that they're not looking at the totality of expenditures. So I would say going back to your life goals, how much money you make, going back to that question, how much? And Sometimes, because I had a consult with someone just uh, this morning, there were some activities that didn't fit their life plan, and we decided to get rid of them. So if those high, very high time cost things are not moving you where you want to be, they might need to go. You, you, know, you have to examine that some more. Okay, selling things, picks for listing. Okay. Great, great. I got numbers. Um, I'm going to say you're going to have to figure out, make your process more efficient. I used to list, believe it or not, 50 to 70 things a day using the eBay system. No ink frog. This is how you do it. You take all of your pictures first. And you got to have some organization. You take all of your pictures first. And since you're taking a picture, you got to have an inventory sheet. Take a picture, mark, you know, say what it is, how big it is, write up a description, write up a very good description, because if you don't, you'll see the picture and you're like, ah, and you have to go get the item again. So take all the pictures, then do all the descriptions, then post, because the pictures are usually the most time consuming thing if you're taking like five or six pictures. So do your activities in batches. So you'll become way more efficient. You don't really need listing tools for 40 or 50 you need listing tools when we got the ink frog we were listing about 100 things a day and the thing is when you relist it makes it easier so at 40 or 50 items per month you should be able to do that because i want you to think you got 40 50 items a month right as soon as they come in to your inventory you should list them uh if you're not getting all 40 and 50 at the same time i don't really see how you would have a problem 
unless you're waiting until you get everything to list. Uh, this is from Steve James, Professor Glendon. Y'all kill me with that. Do you use personal finance software like Quicken or Excel to track your expenses and to know your network? By the way, I've learned more from your videos than I did in college and graduate business school, which only teaches theory. Thanks for the college degree myth because it tells the truth that most people hate. Wow, man. Thanks. Uh, I actually, this is going to kind of shock you. I have extremely simple finances. I don't really do a lot of stuff. Um, now, when I say simple, they're simple compared to when we're doing storage auctions. That's shit. My partner was an accountant, and I think that was one of the reasons that that worked so well. I don't really, I don't spend a lot of money, so I don't really have to track a lot of things. Um, my habits are, and it's just from years and years, every morning I get up and I check all my accounts. <laughs> I check my credit cards account. It's just a habit because when business, if something goes funny, you got to know about it as soon as possible. So, and I don't have a lot of stuff. When I say stuff, I don't have a lot of credit card bills. I don't have a lot of things that I have to keep track of. So my life's real simple that I don't really need that stuff. I don't have any complicated financial schemes or anything like that. I mean, my stuff is super, super simple. It's uh, manage what I have and make more. Uh, Timothy saying Turbo Lister is a good tool as well. And that Turbo Lister is for eBay. Uh, this is from Chris. Let's see. Showed up, went to two store trucks today, one hour from home, one locker. I said, if it was four, it was chick stuff, not my forte. 170 went through, sell fast, 1500. Take my time, 3K. Uh, my biggest hit starting December 24th, fifth locker. And yes, went through all three of your 700 videos. Yes, NBA here. Your free videos learn more than TV, Glennon. Thanks. I, I mean, a lot of people don't know what's in the older videos because they don't like that search function. I really appreciate that, Chris. Um, you kind of bring up something that I've talked about in many videos. This is an awesome time of year to get deals for storage auctions. This Because everyone is broke or they're taking off. And you can literally go to an auction and there might be the only one there. And some places will not let, hold the auction unless there's three people. But if they know you, they may go with it. So now, uh, just while you know, people are thinking about some questions. I'm gonna do some a little different. Um, I'm gonna do the credit thing again because the way that I'm doing it with personal credit first is personal credit highly impacts what business credits you get. And you gotta be very, very careful with business credit. Um, a lot of people talk about getting best business credit. Business credit cards do not have the personal guarantees that personal credit cards do. And if you sign a PG, you can't bankrupt out of that. So there's a lot to be really, really careful with those cards. Um, but we're going to talk about that on a lot of other stuff. So I'm going to wait because sometimes there's a delay. But uh, if that's it, I'm going to shut this down. And tomorrow, there's another webinar. And this will be up in Hustler U. Uh, this is from Steve James. Have you ever thought about writing the book title, How to Be a Hustler? I've got uh, six different ideas I'm kind of percolating on. So the answer would be yes. But it's the problem is, I have been, again, because I really thought about it. I have been selling online since 1999 through eBay, Craigslist, Amazon. I've been a digital hustler my whole, you know, professional career because I never did like, you know, there are people who can go around in the neighborhood, buy something from another person, flip it. I have always been a heavy, heavy, heavy proponent of using online resources for leverage. So it's going to be a different kind of hustler book because most people think about getting over or maybe manipulating somebody. And I never really did that. It's always been an information type hustle. 
I actually, I want to do some private labeling. I did that with furniture, but I haven't done it with anything else. So I kind of halfway know how it works. And, you know, just for some people that don't know, uh, I have an older daughter and I'm going to start teaching her how to do Amazon FBA. And that's kind of one of the things because uh, on the list, I want to talk about creating products and I'm going to give you some background on that. One thing about Amazon is that if you have a hot product that's selling well that you're getting from um, some mass re liquidation source, Amazon's going to go get that product and they're going to undercut you. So to really make Amazon FBA, because I know one person who's a client and he's got a private label product. And like, you know, if any of you ever get a consult from me, I'm not ever going to put like your killer stuff out there. So I can't tell you what it is. Dude only has two products and does 50 G's a month two products that's it but it's private label and he's got a little tweak to it and he you know he dreads the day that amazon figures it out but uh so far eight months he's been good uh this is from jim you've been a huge help to my business since i started listening thanks very much appreciate that jim i really do that makes me feel good Uh, this is from Steven. Can handmade items be sold on Amazon? Yes. Now, let's say what, let's talk about handmade. If you go out and put together certain kind of packages using new stuff, like I'm just throwing this out there. This is not a product. But say you put together a, a, a book bag and it's, a, it's like a Boy Scout kit. It's a brand new bag and it has a ruler, a compass and some other stuff. And you get all this stuff like dirt cheap, right? Say you spend five bucks, but you sell a book bag for 25. You can sell stuff like that all day, all along on Amazon. Um, can you make the hustle book with co collaboration of other authors? I thought about that, but that's the reason that I'm doing Hustler Profiles with the Spreecast, because there's a lot of wonderful people in my trap with killer information, great experiences, and I look at this stuff in terms of speed. To write a book with someone is going to take four times as long as if I wrote it by myself, maybe five times as long. And one of the things that I've learned with um, doing this is information is like ice cream. Sometimes it has a long expiration date. Sometimes it has a short expiration date. But nevertheless, it has an expiration date. So the sooner I get stuff out, the better. But it's not something I would never do, but it's just... Uh, not the big thing. What's up, J JK? Uh, this is uh, from Steve James. Do you create your own websites for blogs? Are websites easy to design? What websites software do you recommend for a beginner like myself? Um, actually, yeah, I do mine, and I'm going to give you my theory on that. What I learned from the Urban Pack right, is design is important to a degree. But there are some websites that I, you know, frequent like Clear James, James Clear, I'm sorry. It's very plain because I go for the information. So design is important to a degree, but if you, it just depends on who you're trying to sell and attract. But I use elegant themes and I use, um, I, I actually tell you a really interesting story. I use uh, Bluehost. Bluehost came to me actually a few weeks ago. Because I was like in this uh, limbo of how I wanted to do a new blog, but I didn't want the blog to be like the short term project. I wanted something that, you know, would be for years and years and years. And they just said, hey, you know, if you become an affiliate, like if you go to my blog and you hit that thing, you know, I get a little change. Um, they gave me a hosting account. So it, it was pretty cool. But the big thing was you can use a lot of templates and my my recommendation would be for you is to get a hosting account but before you spend any money buying any templates go through all of the free ones out there there's like a thousand free ones and you'll be amazed at what you'll come across and you can tweak them and customize them but the website i did uh, hustle food yeah i did that myself but that would be like the 15th blog I've done. The first few, <laughs> I learned a lot. Uh, this is what would be the best way to advertise something like that book bag 
pack if it's being sold on Amazon FBA. All right, I'll give you one. Say you create this club, right? You go on YouTube, you create a video, and you create a channel about this club. Because what I've learned, and because I sold a lot of storage auction books, more so because of the stories, good or bad, than I did with uh, storage auction instructional videos. So you create this podcast, you create this YouTube channel, and you generate interest, and you put a link under the videos going to your Amazon product. Because unless people know it exists, and if they have to have, that has some kind of cool factor, while well, something, they're, they're just not going to buy it. So you can induce people to buy your stuff. I'll give you a perfect example. Everyone here knows what rollerblades are. In the late 80s, early 90s, only people who bought rollerblades were hockey teams. They were for hockey teams to practice in the summer. The company Rollerblade hired this uh, woman. I cannot remember her name, but she was brilliant. So she filmed a bunch of hunky guys on rollerblades going through the park. You know the rest. So there was a product that existed for many years, but until they got the right marketing, it didn't take off. So, that, you know, just to give you an idea of what you can potentially do. What's up, Betty? Uh, just want to say thanks and happy new year. I'm looking forward to this new year just by tracking my jankiness. <laughs> Things have been falling in place and I'm more than pleased. Cool. Congratulations. I saw that. Actually, I know about Dead Mouse 5. Um, I knew someone here that was making them and selling them on Craigslist. It's amazing how those big mouse ears just go off. Oh, this is JK. Uh, Since talking with you in the coaching section, things are looking up in 2004. will be brighter than 2013. Very cool. Uh, this is Jim. I have a few items which I thought would be great for Xmas on Amazon. Used Pinterest for them, but got very little traction. What else should I have done to get uh, it out there? Didn't do PPC ads or YouTube videos. I am not a big fan of pay-per-click unless you're just making a lot of money because you can go through so much money so quick with that. Pinterest, if you're going to use Pinterest, know that Pinterest is like 90% female-driven. Um, if it's not a female product and using Pinterest, you're not going to get a lot of traction. I learned that the hard way. If you're selling shoes, makeup, dresses, things like that, Pinterest is awesome for driving traffic. If you're selling wrenches, mm -mm, nothing's going to happen. So with social media, you got to know where to put your product. I would recommend that you um, get Gary Vanderchuk's book, Jab, 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 because they talk about that. Because the thing is, I learned that Twitter isn't good for my business, but for someone else, it's awesome. My business runs very well on YouTube, podcast, and Facebook. And, there were, you know, Google Plus to a degree, but... I know where my main drivers are. I uh, might be going back to a Kim plan as a tool guy after seven years out. Any thoughts on hustling from a Kim plan? I can't say till you get in there, man. You know, that last hustle you got from your other job, that was pretty sweet. Okay, now uh, I'm going to shut this down in a minute, but just to let you know, Going forward, I'm going to be doing one to two webinars a week. So there's going to be plenty. If, if you miss it, it's going to be up in Hustle U. And it's going to be a ton of information. There's a lot of stuff coming in 2014. A lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sure thing. I like that. Timothy Allen. Thanks, Glendon. Six figures 2014. Definitely. All right, I'm going to shut this puppy down. For those that missed it, it will be in Hustle U tomorrow. I'd like to say thank you to everyone that came out. It was great as always, and I will see y'all on the good side.